but if you can just, if Steve is okay, give you a quick story on each page, just, and then we'll refer back to it, uh, any questions you, Chris, or the, or the team may have. So Stephen, why don't you go quickly to slide four. If there's any new players to the call today, you know, look, our business has grown up quite dramatically over the, the last kind of 12 years. You know, we're now a, a leading global uh, bus and motor coach player, uh, a number of different brands. MCI is the North American coach leader. New Flyer is the North American transit bus leader. Uh, Alexander Dennis is the UK leader as well as the world double deck leader. And of course, Plaxton, you may not see very much. That's a, a UK motor coach brand uh, owned by ADL. Our block is our small, medium sized and cutaways. And then of course our NFI uh, parts business. Next one, Steve. So uh, this slide, slide five, just gives you a little bit of uh, insight into kind of, uh, you know, the, the journey, if you will. The first, you know, 2010 to 2014 was around North American rationalization. We acquired Navi, we, we acquired a small fab, uh, fabrication company called TCB in Indiana, and then the parts business of Orion when it shut down. And then, of course, the next part of our journey was really around the diversification and growth of our business, culminating in Alexander Dennis uh, in May of 2019, pre-pandemic. Pre, uh, so the next slide, um, you know, so here's the, the journey. We've given guidance first time in our history where we've gone past, past uh, next year. We felt important for two reasons. We're seeing kind of SPAC mania with these massive promises of volume and profitability. And so we wanted to give a little bit of reality check and context to it. Uh, the other issue is that, that the pandemic had a pretty serious impact on our business. And we wanted to be able to explain to our shareholders what we thought 21 was going to look like. Uh, we met our revised guidance for 2020 that we had set kind of July, August of last year. And then, of course, what we have for, for plans for 2025, which really is a customer by customer, market by market buildup of what we think we can do, the impact of zero emission buses on our business, as well as the reduction of costs to identify forward. The next slide seven is really, you know, look, the days of us just showing up and, and responding to an RFP and selling a bus are, are gone. We are deeply involved now as a, as a solutions provider. And of course, every city, every part of the world, every funding dynamic, every political scenario is different. And so today, you know, ranging from infrastructure solution uh, sourcing, uh, design, installation, in some cases servicing, but obviously the vehicles. The, the diagnostics is a really interesting one, telematics. And some of you that know me for a while, it's been very frustrating to get public agencies to really use telematics in an appropriate way. The turning point is zero emission vehicles. Because you know while there's a gauge on the dash that says how much battery power, there's such range anxiety or, or lack of understanding of how far it can go and, and so forth. We're really now, uh, there is no turning back in telematics. And of course, the whole element of of aftermarket warranty support is a big, big part of our overall business. Next one, Stephen. So you, any of you that saw our investor day, little tagline that we're using at the bottom there, you know, again, back to some of these promises of EV companies and, and the SPAC uh, businesses, we, you know, look, this is an evolutionary game here. You, you've got these installed buses largely paid by public transit agencies and taxpayer dollars and pulling those vehicles off early and, and giving up economic life just to take on zero emission, we believe is not gonna happen. It's an evolutionary story and a replacement. And so the march uh, from diesel through natural gas to hybrids, now battery electric, trolley electric and, and fuel cell uh, is very much gonna happen over the next 15 to 20 years for sure. It's just a, mass, a matter of the pace. So just some concept at the top, You know, we got a lot of miles uh, with electric vehicles now we've got about 1,371 uh, full zero emission buses in service and then you can see a bunch of the other uh, stats there we believe uh, this year 2021 approximately 20 percent a little bit more of our volume will be zero emission deliveries the next slide uh, you know this is a chart that, that uh, we continue to try and look for macro projections a number of our customers have already started some in bigger ways than others but we you know all the research we can see is on the chart on the left, that the, the, the vehicles, the, the zero emission buses are going to lead every kind of other vehicle in adoption. And it makes sense because you actually have uh, a, a government funding behind it. The next slide, 10, is, you know, again, th these promises of startup co's or new co's that don't necessarily have vehicles in service. You, you know, we've been building buses since 1930. We've been building zero emission buses since 1969. And we've always been kind of a, a first, you know, electric trolleys and natural gas hybrids fuel cell buses and so forth. And of course, we got a little bit more um, you know, granular with the infrastructure solutions launch and a bunch of other things. So we're really, really pleased. And those of you that, that uh, would ever like to, we've set up this vehicle innovation center in, in Alabama and it's fantastic in terms of explaining the reality of zero emission, not just the different you know, bus with a different propulsion system, but everything associated with charging, maintenance, uh, energy use and so on and so forth. 
Next slide, Stephen. The other thing that's actually really quite cool is our strategy has been to be agnostic. And some may see that as a, you know, hell, you're stuck in the old days. The reality is because it's an evolutionary story, we've chosen to put all of our propulsion systems on common proven platforms. The good news is that we can be agile as hell with our customers as, as you know, New York, for example, as they today they have diesels, they have natural gas, they have hybrids and now zero emission uh, Excelsiors. The chart on the right is really quite cool because we don't have to set up a completely new supply chain. Most of the vehicle is exactly the same. Yes, we have to have a, a different strategy for batteries and battery management systems, more integrated and re regenerative braking type things. There's some electronics and components. And then of course the fuel cell dynamics. The good news though, is as we migrate our factories to zero emission, it's on exactly the same production lines. And we've already made all the capital investments to allow those facilities to build the same uh, on the same production lines. The next slide 12 is, is really just kind of a, you know, a, a commercial. We've got every vehicle and every market today offered in zero emission. The only one that we don't have, and there really isn't a market yet, is the pure cutaway where we would take a, a GM or a Ford or a, a Freightliner chassis and, and cut the back off and, and put a body on it in terms of a cutaway. But our Equus Charge was the latest, the, you know, the small medium class vehicle that was, that was announced and launched uh, two weeks ago. But every one of our other vehicles uh, has zero emissions already offerable. Uh, slide 13 is a, you know, this is just a, a little bit of a color on our UK facilities. The same thing happens over there, albeit a slightly different strategy. We are building uh, zero emission vehicles through a partnership with, with uh, BYD. And that happened pre-New Flyers acquisition of, of Alexander Dennis. It is absolutely dominant in the space. You know, 75% of the plus of, North, of uh, UK uh, zero emissions are ours. And uh, we've gone one step further with BYD by the fourth quarter of this year, we will actually be building their chassis in our facilities uh, and assembling them and then integrating the body. So pretty progressive approach there, you know, quite interesting, like many industries in one market where we're uh, arch rivals in North America with BYD. And yet in the UK, we become very, very solid integrated partners. The next slide, slide 14, one of the things that is often misunderstood especially by our, our friends in the political realm, is the reality of batteries. Not all batteries are the same, A, and B, there are different types of batteries for different types of vehicles, whether you want on-route charging, depot charging, fuel cell, and so forth. So on the left-hand side in North America, we build our own battery packs. So we, we, don't, we buy the cells uh, today from two primary suppliers, Exalt and, and A123. They, they put them into a module for us. We then build the battery packs in our own factories, we source whatever software battery management systems are associated with it. We integrate it into the vehicles and then we use Connect to do the, the monitoring of those vehicles, not only for installation, testing, delivery, but also in service. On the right hand side is the example I just explained where we team with BYD in, in the UK. In North America, we have integrated batteries into our uh, double deck chassis that's offered by ADL and those buses uh, are now starting to, to deliver from the UK. The next one is uh, just a, an application I talked about before, I will spend a lot of time, but we're starting to get revenue in places we've never had before, infrastructure solutions, the telematics dynamics. Uh, and of course, we still have by far the largest dominant position in, in part supply of not just new flyer MCI buses, but everyone's. Lots of people say to us, well, wait a minute, zero emissions coming, it's gonna kill your parts business. Over the next 50 years, you're absolutely right. It will change our parts business, some parts of our parts business. Having said that, we are getting revenue sources that we never had before. And we are also getting margin contribution on say things like battery manufacturing that we didn't have. Next slide. Uh, again, many of you have listened to my story over the last couple of years that you know we, we wait, 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 we're gonna see government support. And the good news is we've seen significant movement in government support. On the left, very quickly, those of you that have been paying any attention to it closely, the first thing was in October of last year where the federal government allowed the, the Canadian Infrastructure Bank a billion and a half dollars. The sole mission was to work with transit agencies to pull forward savings and to invest in zero emissions and charging infrastructure. And, C, and CIB is active with a number of Canadian operators. The second and more probably transformational funding announcement was what happened in February. Details so far a little bit sketchy, but this concept that the Canadian government now is going to do two things. One, invest in public transit as a recurrent investment, and B, uh, have so much more money focused on the physical bus and the infrastructure. That's a big game changer for us in Canada. In the middle of the U.S., you know, we've, we've seen federal funding since 19-whatever, 60-something. Uh, there has been lots of money in the last number of years for pilot projects and so forth. The, uh, the Invest in America Act that was uh, tabled last year and is now going to be tabled again the next draft when it expires in October of this year 
the original draft had five times as much money uh, focused on zero emission bus procurement. And of course, the, uh, the platform of uh, President Biden and Vice President uh, Harris around not only public transit being critical for congestion in cities, but also the, the element of green transit uh, is a big one. And then the last one, of course, prior to COVID, uh, the Prime Minister of Britain made big promises around uh, uh, funding. Uh, that really got kind of sidelines with his own COVID and the world that COVID and impact on the UK. And in the last kind of month and a half, we've started to see money actually flow both from the federal government in the UK, but also from the Scottish government. And there are more announcements to come. So that promise of government support has turned now into actual action. Uh, slide 17, you know, you can debate this all day long. The source is us. What we did is we used all the available sources we could find. We took our own assessment of our customers and we took a stab at pace of adoption. And this will change every you know, year, every quarter as we learn more. But we think the fastest place where we do business is going to be the UK. We think by 2023, you know, nearly half of that market is going to be converted to zero emission. In the top left, North America, the heavy duty, as I said before, if there was a used market for transit buses, we may see some of these guys convert uh, or, or transition earlier. I believe that we're going to see a replacement oriented transition, which means we think by 2023, there's about 21% of the total market will have been converted. And then, of course, on the bottom, the, the private motor coach in North America and the small cutaway business, we think are going to be negligible just because you're taking a 50, $70,000 cutaway and saying now you're going to put 100 grand of batteries in it. And that bus is designed for a five to seven year life. And so that whole thing dynamic is going to have to change. The next slide, Stephen, uh, 18, something you may have seen, we announced uh, a couple of weeks ago. And again, it's not for prime time yet today, but this whole concept of how do we use autonomous uh, vehicle and uh, driver assist technology to improve buses and service. And so we, we've done two things. We've worked at grassroots stuff like lane departure and adaptive cruise control and 360 cameras and all this other stuff from kind of stage one or stage two or three autonomous. We actually pioneered have now shown uh, the world that it, that it can work all the way to the stage four uh, for, for a heavy, trans, heavy duty transit bus. And so that project is well on its way. It's funded. And that project, we're now literally line entering those buses, I think, in the next month. And they will go into service at the end of this year, if not early uh, 2022 in Connecticut. On the other side, uh, we're working with other customers, Alexander Dennis and others, of what, how, to, how to use the autonomous element in, a, uh, you know, in an operating environment of a yard. How do we efficiently charge the bus, wash it, move it, and park it without a whole bunch of people around so we can save costs and ensure density of parking and all those kind of diagnoses that go with it. Some pretty cool stuff. Uh, the next slide, Stephen, is uh, just you know, kind of give you some, a little bit of color on how we ended the year. Obviously, you see on the left, you know, sales were only off by, you know, four or five hundred million dollars, but the drop through was absolutely dramatic. We idled our factories for essentially two months and we took some, you know, balance sheet uh, write downs. We eliminated the, the pre-owned coach pool at, uh, at MCI and so forth. Good news, though, is we were able to come at uh, 157.7 compared to guidance on, on average it was about 150 on the right. Cash flow was very interesting in managing that through the year, trying to get paid at different times, working with our suppliers to manage payables and so forth. We renegotiated our credit agreement first in April, and then uh, Papastro and Stephen did a magical job of getting kind of the next chapter of our credit agreement in December, which really gives us runway and flexible covenants for the next uh, two years, all the way to the end of 22 and into 2023. And then, of course, you're all well aware we did a, a uh, bought deal. Uh, you know, the timing was really around, hey, We've just gone through a crisis. We don't know how long, you know, wave two is going to go and if there's going to be wave three. We don't know the pace of vaccinations. We've now had some interest in the in the share in a, in New Flyer as an investment. We're really pleased with our zero emission path. Uh, why don't we just take a turn, uh, an approach to try and reduce our total leverage, more important, give us a little bit more liquidity flexibility. And we had a number of investors say, geez, I really like your business. Uh, I'd like to get in there, but really not sure I'm interested in getting in a five or six times leverage business. So that was the, the logic behind the timing. Uh, the next one, quickly, you know that we launched uh, as we got into COVID and we started to understand what it really meant. We launched an initiative to kind of pivot. Our words are something like, you know, from a pure hold co with a bunch of bus businesses to a, a more integrated operating company. So we've already synchronized and harmonized all the accounting and, fi and finance, uh, HR functions. We're working on the global supply chain. It's gone well. And then there's some facility and optimization rationalization. So uh, from August to uh, December of last year, we were able to eliminate $17 million of, uh, of cost. And uh, you can see that we're on target for about 47 this year. And then we're currently 
uh, on target as we start 2023 to be about 67 million of run rate costs and another 10 million of cash flow uh, optimization. So really pleased with that, with that initiative. 2021 guidance, you, you know, you've seen this probably in our materials. Revenue will go up. Adjusted EBITDA, we're targeting for 220 to 240. We're in a good, pretty good place right now. The number of slots that are sold relative to the total plan slots for the year, probably in, a, in back to kind of the same ratios of, of comfort that we saw in 20, kind of 19. We're still going to spend money. We got maintenance capex, but we had assigned about $15 million to go get some of these NFI forward savings. And then, of course, you can see our ATR. I will point out. Uh, that, uh, you know, we have a 53 week year. And so the extra week is effectively in Q4. And we do have that continued amplification of our seasonality where Q1 is going to be less than the others. Uh, so quickly, uh, you know, again, I won't through much detail here on, on 22, 2025, you know, this is not us just using a dartboard. We, we went back to our individual uh, customers, markets where we could, the projection of zero emission impact, the projection of NFI cost takeout, we added uh, any of the margin recovery we think we'd get in terms of cost down around battery supply and packaging and so forth. And then of course, the, the right sizing of our balance sheet, uh, specifically as we ballooned our working capital when we shut our facilities down and we got stuck with some finished goods that are now working through the system to get back in a double digit ROIC. 23, you know, the priorities haven't changed. Look, it is absolutely fundamental that we get back down to our two and a half to two to two and a half around leverage. And so that's our focus. No question, we are laser focused on where we're going to invest money. There's there's higher ORC or cash flow payback windows. We continue to believe in investments in, in our shareholders uh, return in terms of dividends. We did cut it in half, but that's an important part of our story uh, to, to be able to show confidence in our business and our ability to pay back uh, you know some of that investment to our shareholders. And then, of course, we're not off the, the path of looking at what else might make sense for our business from an acquisition. Clearly, that's not a priority right now. We're pleased with our technology and our facilities uh, and our approach to, to zero emission. But there are things we continue to keep our eye on. And, of course, at the end of the day, if there's an opportunity, we'll look for share repurchase. So last slide. Finally, the, the thesis. Look, we're in a great place. We're the market leader. There is no question. And while there are many promises around zero emission uh, companies, or even businesses like Proterra that kind of packages themselves for the startup that's been around for 16 years. Look, we are here, we are leading in our spaces, we're leading in the zero emission market shares and we're really pleased at the pace that that's gone. The government support is, can't be underestimated. It is now actually taking root as opposed to a promise. Uh, you know, we've, we've got the machine, we've got the facilities, we've converted all of our facilities to be able to, to build not only a diesel or a natural gas, but a zero emission and in some cases a fuel cell vehicle. We've really pivoted to add other things that go with it, uh, engineering services, uh, infrastructure services, telematics, and so forth. Yes, our backlog has come down. Thank God we had a backlog through the end of 19 and, and through 20. Uh, but today, the backlog is starting to show signs of, of recovery. About 6% of it now is zero emission, and about 30% of what we're bidding on right now is zero emission. So it's not if, it's going to happen. Um, the, the NFI forward has allowed us now to really think about a more cost-effective business. Some of it you could argue we could have done sooner, uh, but I'll tell you, you know, COVID and the un uncertainty of the future uh, of the business really forced us to move efficiently. And uh, we sad we had to eliminate the executive team at MC MCI. The, the new flower team's done a great job picking it up. And we took the most seasoned leader we had, Ian Smart, and put him in charge of that whole transformation. And so we're, we're pretty excited about the progress there. Uh, so COVID, you know, set it back. We're back on track. We see 2021 as a transition year, and we're pretty excited about our continuing market leadership as we go forward. So, Chris, uh, over back over to you. Uh, fire away. Yeah, thanks, Paul. So, uh, you know, just I guess starting with it, um, you know, Steve, maybe slide six is a good place to start. So. I know we really didn't talk a little bit about it, but when you laid out the uh, the longer term goals at your investor day. Um, can you walk us through, you know, I think, I think everybody's got a reasonable understanding about, you know, what, what this year kind of looks like. Um, but what are the moving parts that get you from 21 to 25? And along that, you know, part of that um, is how to think about certain segments of the business. So if you just want to maybe delve into, into how you get there um, and your confidence level on getting there. Um, yeah. That's, we'll go that's a good question. Yeah. And again, the context was, look, we're recovering from COVID, but, and we're down, but we're not out. And we see a path with a high degree of confidence of our execution of those 25, 2025 targets. And you heard it in our investor day of the way 
our chairman described it and, and even Papasu in terms of a you know fairly conservative perspective to get back there. So you know we went back to our 2019 business of where the mix was, where the margins were. We you know looked at the impact for 2020. It was a result of COVID again, adding back now. If we can take out 65 million plus of overhead, we're gonna go ahead and do that. That's well on track. We then looked at the percentage of orders that we think we that we have and that we think will win and what the margins of zero emission look like. And while they're not wildly different, we're starting to see potentially better margins right now in the zero emission because we're making money on stuff we didn't make before. For example, we buy the battery cells and modules, but we package them. So we make the package, we do the integration, we do the installation. That's labor and value add activities that we didn't get paid for before because we installed somebody else's engine and, and went on. And so we're starting to see some of that. The other part of the battery margin dynamic going forward is we've already seen battery you know, prices on average in the last five years drop by something like 75 or 80%. It's continuing to come down. In addition, the range or energy density, as well as the physical footprint inside the vehicle allows us to get lighter buses and therefore more fuel efficient and on and on. So there's margin opportunity and zero emission we didn't have before. We also have looked at some of the markets that we uh, th that kind of have been up and down. You know, the, the MCI market in 2020 was decimated. I mean, the amount of commercial market buses that were sold were negligible by us and everybody else. And while I don't think that's going to recover in 21, we'll see some sales of commercial vehicles. We'll see a little bit in 2022, but we think talking to our customers, it's 23 or 24 before the motor coach market starts to get back to, up to in our world of about a thousand units a year. We do believe that the government portion of motor coach will continue. And quite exciting is that they're taking more and more interest in zero emission. And so this isn't coast to coast type motor coach. This is, you know, shuttles into cities or commuters from hundred miles away or 60 miles away. And they really like the zero emission. So the, the price and the margin potentials there, the parts business is an area that over the five-year window will start to see a little bit pressure. Intuitively, you'd say more of zero emission needs less spare parts. That's true. But in a, uh, today's world, we don't sell a lot of Cummins parts. We don't sell a lot of Allison parts or uh, Thermo King air conditioning because they have their own distribution outlets. So the biggest impact on zero emission buses for parts is not stuff that we normally sell. The stuff that we sell that we impacted is primarily around the brake dynamic. Because if you're really good and really smart and effective driver, you're not using the brakes all that, you're using the regenerative braking uh, on the vehicles. And so that's why we've looked at alternate materials. We've looked at now moving into the cutaway space. We've taken over the Alexander Dennis supply of spare parts, all at NFI parts. We've reduced our warehousing locations from, I think, 22 down to something like 13. We're trying to get down to seven or eight. There's overhead takeout to make that business more efficient and so on and so forth. The recovery also from 2020 into 2025 has a lot to do with the UK market. If you look at one of the charts in our deck later on, it, it actually gives you, it's in the appendix showing you the UK market before we bought Alexander Dennis, that market had gone through four or five years of reduction of fleet replacement. And uh, what we had excited, we're excited about is the, is the forecast for 2020 on was to start to see the curve go back on fleet replacement. So combine the tired fleet in the UK now with federal government support, UK, Scotland, Ireland around uh, rejuvenation with zero emission vehicles gives us an added uh, excitement about the ultimate effective payback of the uh, of the Alexander's investment. So, you know, this is what I was referring to at the bottom of the right hand chart here. You see from 2015 to 2020 that the UK market continued to slow down. But when you look at the average age of the fleet in the UK, it's getting it's getting old and there's economies around, you know, a, a 15 or a 17 or 20 year old vehicle is very expensive to operate. So we're, we're quite encouraged that if we could you know, get our crystal ball out, which we did for our 2021 to 2025, we think the market in the UK is going to recover, which gives us, you know, an added lift to that business. Chris, does that help kind of give you enough of the different pieces? Yeah, no, that, that, that's helpful. So one of the other questions I, I get um, from time to time is, and, and maybe it'll change um, as we, as we evolve through the year, but there's been a lot of the debate about, you know, transit in cities, um, you know, work from home. Uh, and it, in a lot of ways, you guys have been impacted by sort of, you know, I've had lots of investors tell me no one's ever getting on a bus again. Um, but at the same time, you know, there seems to be some disconnect because we're seeing a lot of money going into transit. Well, here's my view. And, you know, again, jaded, uh, opinionated position. But 
kind of my view is the following. Yes, public transit had the ridership through 2015 to through 2020 was slowly dropping, you know, whatever the ratios, right? But I, you and I have had this conversation many times, whether there's 51 people or 46 on the bus, they're still driving the bus, but that's a five or seven or 8% drop in, in ridership. Uh, over time, route structures, frequencies, and so forth will change. So COVID then sends everybody home. Nobody goes to work. Nobody goes out on the road in terms of uh, tour and charter or Greyhound type service in between cities. Even the employee shuttle slow down and so forth. We now have uh, lots of more safety dynamics on the vehicles, clean and protect products and so forth. You have some cities now operating more vehicles on their routes to have less people and therefore social distancing. But you also have now have vaccines starting to make their way, some level of herd immunity helping in some areas. I also believe we have a pent up demand of people wanting to interact and see the world again. And so, yes, there are still going to be in the future more people working from home than we've ever seen. But we're also going to see, uh, you know, instead of five days at home, we're going to see three or four days uh, at work and two days at home and those kind of things. And so from a transit perspective, we're trying to plan routes and cities to operate at some kind of even keel. Here's the other dynamic that, that from a motor coach perspective, we're gonna to start to see more people go back. There's been no pro sports of people going to, no college sports, no inner city university travel and on and on and on. I, I can't imagine that is gonna go away. I, in fact, I think there's pent up demand to get back on that. Here's the last thing I'll share. And this is again, is a, our kind of, let's call it educator perspective. When I first started in this business 12 years ago, I had a million people say to me, you're going out of business because light rail and uh, trains and subways are going to kill you. And so what we start with, and you guys in Toronto and others will see these projects of a light rail project or a, a, a subway extension that was supposed to be $5 billion in four years is now $12 billion in 10 years. And that's two and a half or three political cycles. And it's massive disruption. The advent and introduction of zero emission vehicles that look, smell, feel more efficient, that are way more quiet, the desire to have uh, less congestion in cities, and the ability in one political cycle to have two, three, four, five hundred 500 vehicles invested on the road and in service and impacting not only the environment, but congestion is massive. So when I go around and talk to a lot of politicians that today or historically were, you know, subways are the only way or light rail, there's a lot more interest in bus rapid transit or right of way buses or dedicated rainways to move people through cities. And of course, now that it's zero emission, we don't worry about, you know, the, the joke or the, about the smoke coming out of the bus. So our forecast is, is a little bit, yes, there's going to be dynamics that will change our world. Maybe we'll see in some cases some smaller vehicles or double decks so you have way more seated capacity. Maybe the change in some of the cities with high velocity will have more Arctic and so forth. We think we're going to get back up to normal uh, efficiency or operating or buying rates of our primary business public transit back in that window of, of from now to 2025. Okay. Sounds great. Um you know, one of the other things that, that we start thinking about, um, you know, and if you think about, you know, even the journey of how you guys um, kind of got here, um, part of it for you guys was about, you know, rationalizing the market at, at the front end. Um, and now you've got a bunch of new competitors coming. Um, you know, some of them arguably are pretty legitimate. Some of them might be a little more, call it, you know, nice in theory on paper. Um, but how do you think that these newer entrants, especially into the, the electric vehicle market, disrupt the business? Um, and, you know, do we look at, you know, down the road, you guys got to go, you know, roll up the business again just to keep it going? Well, uh, it's a really good question. It's very topical. And all we got to do is add up the promises of the last 30 EV SPACs and the number of vehicles that they're promising to make are five times what the market size is anyway. So there's gonna be winners and losers in that space. But let's talk about more competitors. Let's just kind of zero it down. In North America, the public transit space, we got the three legacy guys, us, Nova and Gilly. And all of us are involved more or less in zero emission vehicles. In our case, we're completely integrated. In the Nova's case, they've partnered with, I think it's BAE. And in um, in Gilly's case, they've partnered with, uh, with Cummins. Um, we had BYD show up. We had BYD first bring in you know, buses in the boxes from China. They've had challenges with performance and delivery and quality and so forth. And of course the US government uh, you know, put out the, uh, the, 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 the law that by the end of 2022, you can't use federal money to buy you know, Chinese owned controlled or state uh, subsidized businesses. And so 
BYD's competitiveness in public transit has really slowed down. Then you got our friends at Proterra, again, I'm not to poke fun, been around 16 years, raised six, I think, of that $800 million, now went through a SPAC and got a bunch of money. But if you read Proterra's business plan, the vast majority of the growth in their business is not coming from buses. It's energy storage, energy packaging, as well as you know Proterra batteries inside. I also argue, and, and I think our position and our scalability around the way we build buses compared to their you know, boat type buses, the ability to modify and customize you know, I'll bet on our game all day long. They also don't offer uh, diesel or hybrid or natural gas or fuel cell. And so the ability to solve all the customer's problems is limited. So the only real guy new to our space in North America that's made any comments, we heard about Van Hool showing up, that died, is now Arrival. And what Arrival wants to do is build buses in micro factories around the world at a diff you know, differential strategy and cost. Arrival has not bid on anything yet. Arrival has not gone to Altoona. And we shall see whether Arrival's product and their strategy is going to be robust enough for those kind of testing and market standards, which goes back to we got to get our costs down, we got to get our price efficiency, we got to keep buying batteries cheaper and change the batteries over time, maybe from pouches to cylindrical and move those costs down. I'm not so sure I got a bunch of new competitors, but the competitive dynamics have changed. In the motor coach space in North America, it's the same game. We got all the same legacy players, us, uh, Prevo, and uh, Van Hool, which imports through ABC. And then we've had, uh, you know, Daimler talk about coming back. We get buses imported from Turkey and so forth. But until that market really takes back and it, come, you know, goes full speed ahead on a, a commercial space, which is three, four, five years from now, the only market to had is the government space. And there's only two of us that are by America compliant. I'm feeling not bad there. Plus, I'm way ahead on the zero emission game. If you look at the UK market, we have the legacy players of us up there, which is Ashok Leyland. And then you have... Um, uh, right bus, which went through administration and has now come back out, which is really doesn't have a zero emission vehicle or a battery vehicle. That's a fuel cell vehicle. We have a partnership with BID. We've got a massive running start on market share. The only new player there is again, is this arrival. And they've announced they're going to start demoing or testing vehicles in the UK in the fourth quarter of this year. No question. We got to be competitive on price range, cost, efficiency, and so forth. Again, I like my place. I've not seen a whole bunch of new competitors. The Chinese have tried to make some noise there through Yu Tong and so forth, but haven't really got any traction. Always got to be paranoid about the competitive dynamics. Um, so, you know, like, yes, there is a bunch of discussion about us, but when you pare it down to a whole bunch of new competitors, it's more the game is changing than the number of players being, that, that are entering the space. Okay, fair enough. Um, so, you know, part of the, call it the restructuring or the, or, or the, as you said, you know, taking it from a collection of companies to, to integrating again over the next few years um, is really tied to maybe your history with M and A. Um, and I know you've said in the past that BYD gave you a really neat platform to go and learn how to joint venture internationally, go globally. Um, but you know, how does M and A um, kind of work into your world? Is and it, is there anything else that you really want to get into? I think we've talked about school buses before. And adjacent markets, things like that. But but you know, how do we think about M and A, or is it just like digest what we've done over the last few years is, is maybe the right way? To it, it's a really good question, Chris, and it kind of goes to the art or not the art, but the essence of what our strategy has been to date. The first thing we did back in you know, kind of let's call it nine, ten, eleven, and twelve was fix our railroad internally. And part of that was not only lean implementation and flow in factories and point of use inventories and better engineering systems. But a lot of it had to do, or not a lot, some of it had to do with the, the, the strategic in-source of certain components to control our own cost time and, and quality. So, for example, fiberglass is not a trivial business when you're talking about big bus parts. And now we control 98% of that supply chain for ourselves. The next thing we did was, was, was we uh, vertically, sorry, horizontally acquired businesses, knowing full well in our minds we're ultimately going to zero emission. And so an engine is no longer relative engine emission in North America or an emission in UK is no longer relevant. It's now around optimization of batteries and energy uh, design efficiency and all these other things. And so we felt to be relevant against any of the big players, we had to have scale, which is why we went and got a motor coach guy. We went and got a small bus guy and we went and got an international guy. Alexander Dennis, we bought for two reasons. One was the, the market leadership, not only in the UK, but the world double deck. But also they've proven that they can actually market, develop and grow. I mean, they did it in Pac Rim, they did it in North America, they did it in Europe through uh, Switzerland and now Germany and so forth. The other thing we did then is we went sideways a little bit on what's in our basket. Well, we added telematics, we added a lot of the parts and, and tried to harmonize and optimize our parts machine. 
But now we're in infrastructure solutions where we're getting paid for stuff we never got paid before. Plus we're way deeper inside of the operator of how the whole thing works. So our M&A discussions going forward, we don't think we really need much more insourcing. I mean, we can optimize and we could tweak, but we, we got the machine for that. There is telematics tools that today we buy that we may want to get a little bit more deeper in. There are service contracts. Now they have zero emission buses or infrastructures that we're starting to think about that historically we never had anything to do with. And, and then there's the whole dynamic around the infrastructure solutions. Look, we've talked to some operators. We've talked to some cities about broader scenarios. Don't just sell me the bus and then set up my charger. What about you know public-private partnerships? What about installation with service contracts and so forth? So not only do we have different revenue streams, but we got stickier revenue for the long term, which goes back to we're not just selling a bus anymore, we're selling a solution. And so any of the M&A stuff you may see us look at or do, Chris, is really around adding to this offering, and then we'll look at other markets like school buses or whatever, if and when that's appropriate. Um, and of course, overlay with that, the whole world's recovering for, from a pandemic. And so it's not like any market close to us is off and running, right? We're all in a recovery mode. Who knows whether some buys or opportunities will come and be part of that, which then goes back to our, our capital allocation discussion. Let's continue to drive back where we were before from a, a leverage perspective and have the cash flow flexibility that if there is opportunities, we can move. Okay. So maybe uh, maybe if I can back you up for half a second. So for folks who really aren't under, who don't have kind of a, a deep background, um, can you maybe spend a couple seconds talking about some of the, call it the ends of the life cycle, um, both the front end and the back end, and maybe maybe we explain a bit more what infrastructure solutions is, and maybe talk a little bit about as well. I think you guys have started talking about you know things like recycling batteries and taking bus buses back, and you know like can you just talk about how the market's evolving, where you're you're kind of you're not just selling a bus anymore. Yeah. Well, first of all, the vast majority of our business is kind of a marriage, meaning we sell a vehicle to a customer, but it's not like they trade that thing all the time. You know, they, once they've bought it in Canada, the, you know, 20 years, in the U.S., 15, 16 years, in, in the U.K., 20 years, Hong Kong, 20 years. The really, the used market, with the exception of the motor coach space, doesn't exist. So these guys buy an asset and they ride it for life. And, you know, we always joke that the cost of operating, not joke, but, uh, you know, the analogy when we, we, the cost of operating a bus is, it's like a bathtub curve. The first year or two is where the, anything's going to break, it's going to break. That bus then lives for a number of years with, you know, certain maintenance, preventative maintenance, and so forth. And then when that bus gets close to its end of life, that's when the damn thing's expensive as hell to operate. Spare parts, fuel inefficient, and so on and so forth. So historically, we sold a vehicle, and in some cases, we sold service throughout, and but most part, we sold spare parts. The zero emission dynamic dramatically changes it. And I go back to what I said before. We fundamentally believe it's not like people are going to take a whole bunch of diesel buses off the road tomorrow and put zero emissions in. As they pull these out of service, they're going to want to put zero emission buses, which means our market's not going to grow at massive rates, but the replacement cycle is going to be more dollars because they're more expensive and now the service infrastructure. And our first number of deployments, let's call it a handful, a dozen of zero emissions, they were so frustrating because we built the bus to a certain spec. We handed the bus over to the operator and they're mad at us because the charger, the energy, the whatever doesn't work. And of course, the bus is sitting on the side of the road. It's got my logo on it. New Flyer's a bad guy. And so we, you know, I wish I could say we were that smart, but we fell into the infrastructure that not only is it a business opportunity, it's critical to the infrastructure, op to the operation of that, that vehicle. And that's why we really start to believe more and more. And it may evolve into bigger, you know, I've talked to one transit agency about, hey, what about a public-private partnership with the operator, with us? We'll provide the vehicles, the charging, we'll go get the utility, we'll set up a 20-year service type play, and let's optimize the hell out of this capital public investment. And put me in the game, not only for opportunity, but I got to deliver a vehicle that's going to last that long and, and operate in service and so on and so forth. So, you, you know, that whole desire to look through the life cycle, Chris, about where can we participate as well, not only from a, a, a revenue or an income perspective, but ensuring our brand of our buses are lasting and they're the best, lowest cost, total cost of ownership. And I think just now that with the, the whole pressure on zero emission and environment and expensive vehicles, the public oversight on that this thing has to work as opposed to I got an extra 20 buses sitting in the backyard that if that diesel doesn't work, I put another one in service. The, the, the spotlight is on this space. The good news is the government's come to the table with money. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, you know, the next question I had for you, um, 
you know, and, and thinking about, you know, some of your other partners, um, but one of them that we haven't heard a little or much from over the last little while is Marco Polo. Um, and as you guys, you know, continue to, to, to work internationally, I mean, where is that relationship at today? And, and you know, has that changed as, as you guys run electric? You know, just for those that aren't close to the story, uh, 2013, you know, we're making some good progress. We got two competitors for sale, Orion and Nabi. We know that Marco Polo had bought and invested around the world. We heard they were snooping in North America. Oh, my God, what if they buy one of our competitors? We convinced them to come in and invest in us, and then we went and bought those guys. And so the advent of that discussion is Marco Polo wanted a, a presence in North America. They wanted an insight or a window to the market. What we wanted was the opportunity to really accelerate the optimization and rationalization of the business. went well. So they own 19.99%. We put in a strategic MOU to look for opportunities. The problem is we build fully integrated buses and they build bodies that go on somebody else's chassis. And so, you know, the, the opportunities that we were hoping for really haven't come to light. We took a couple of their buses two years, three years ago that were smaller buses that we thought maybe displaced cutaways. We took them around North America. Ah, God, didn't work. We looked at some of their motor coaches. Could we introduce some of those in North America? Oh, gosh, not really the right designer style. We also then looked at some of the things globally. Could we participate with them? The problem is pre-ADL, we didn't do work outside North America. The ability to take a, a new flyer Excelsior from Winnipeg and ship it to friggin' Singapore, it's just not gonna work. Whether it's the, the, the freight logistics, but also the price point, the style, the design, the life cycle. So then we got Alexander Dennis and, and, and Marco Polo was very keen on it because they saw the ability for future collaboration. Marco Polo's in Australia, for example, we're in we you know we're in a big way in New Zealand. They sell buses in Latin America. Could we do some stuff? They liked our zero emission approach. Problem again is they don't make chassis, and so you know, and we don't make chassis. We made integrated buses. So all that to say, they got in trouble about four or five years ago on a balance sheet. They sold ten percent of their shareholding. They still own ten and point two or whatever the hell the number is, ten percent. They still have a guy on our board who's a very you know, well thought, well experienced automotive type guy really knows that uh, Marco Polo well. We continue to look for opportunities. Nothing's really popped up, but they've been a very patient, supportive shareholder. The other part of it is quite honestly, now with Alexander Dennis uh, together, we're looking for places we might go together. So far, none have popped up, but it's a little bit like I got a, a good uncle now that I can pick up the phone and say, hey, have you seen this in that part of the world? What do you see there? Who do you know? What markets? We, we have a network now with Alexander Dennis and, and Marco Polo being part a uh, shareholder to help us think about where ADL goes in the future. So, I, you know, watch this space, but it's not like I expect any change to that anytime soon. Okay. <clears throat> Alongside that, you know, one of the partners that you have with ADL is BYD. Um, and at least in North America, it kind of feels like they're they're probably going to be um, handcuffed anyway in the U.S. Maybe not as much in Canada, but you know we'll see where that one goes. You know, do you think there's an opportunity down the road to do some sort of deal with with them to where you'll kind of take over what they've got here, you know, giving them a graceful exit out of the marketplace in the, in the U.S. and return you maybe do something with them internationally? Well, look, I'd say that's a little bit speculative. Uh, but look look at it from our perspective. You know, we, we hated each other's guts in North America, tooth and nail. You know, we celebrated their failures and they cheered our failures and blah, blah, blah. The, the U.S. government really took the wind out of their sails with their kind of anti-Chinese position on, on that. You know, then we buy Alexander Dennis and we find a very cooperative relationship. And, and always worrying, boy, is, is BYD going to ultimately scoop us in the U.K. or whatever? And so... You know, the, the ADL team found a way to get deeper and deeper with ADL where we're now going to build those things as, as a much deeper partner. And I think that opens up for a broader conversation. At the end of the day, while BYD makes vehicles, it's a battery company at its core. And as I said before, rather than us getting too deep on one battery supplier, our view is that we got to be the best buyers of cells and the best integrator into our buses, not necessarily the manufacturer. We'll assemble this stuff, but the ability to migrate from whether it's Exalt to A123, which is another Chinese battery company, to you know investigate, pick one, LG Chem, and does their cells make sense as price comes down and so forth? Maybe BYD sells inside of a, a, a new flyer bus in the future. Who knows? But I think our position is we want to be the best buyers and the most agile integrators, not married to any one battery provider, because that game is changing crazy fast. 
and uh, and you know we need to be as agile as we possibly can. So far, that's worked extremely well, and now we meet every bloody day or week with with global battery suppliers, both the cell manufacturer but the integrator into the into their battery packs and modules, and we're learning a whole bunch about pricing, range, packaging, cooling, battery management systems. We're way smarter than if we were deep, deep, deep in one player with our head down. Okay. Um, you know, you guys just completed the equity raise, and and but it's also interesting to look at some of the valuations that some of these competitors are getting. You know, is there someone out there that that you guys have at least looked at in in the cult SPAC world that you think actually is going to be a good comp for your type of business? And 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 how do you think about you know the valuations of some of these guys are getting down in the U.S. and it, you know, I, I get asked the question, you know, would it be good for you guys to cross list considering that, I don't know, what is it, 70 percent of the business comes out of the U.S. market? Yeah, yeah. it's a really good question. And of course, you know, we're, we're naysayers to some extent. We read these back business plans and we go, OK, you made eight school buses or 80 school buses and eight trucks last year. And in three years, you're going to go 20,000 vehicles like that's freaking hard. And, and so the execution ability of some of those SPACs and, and the valuations blow our minds. So we, it's hard to compare us to them. And we're also painted with, hey, you're a legacy provider. The irony is we're a zero emission bus company that, oh, by the way, has made other buses for 80, 90 years, right? And it's not like we're behind on the product. In fact, we're ahead. It's not like we're behind on the relationships and the service infrastructure and so forth. So from a valuation perspective, you know, we've made really good strides in the last, let's call it six, eight months. I think the us putting a, a peg in the ground around 2025 or where we think we can get with good, solid, reasonable, believable returns ha, has boded well for us. We've look, I'd, I'd be lying to say we haven't looked at SPACs every which way to see if any of that makes sense for us. We are actively continuing to look at our listing on the TSX or any listing in the US that might make sense for our business and what it might mean. We've absolutely looked at all kinds of funky stuff like tracking stocks and on and on and on. And so, you know, what's not lost on us is we're trying to run a good, solid uh, foundational business, but we're also got one eye on how do we potentially capture some valuation like the others have. What I don't want to do is go out and get all kinds of excitement, get a U.S. listing, jack price our share price up and then have the thing fall and, and, and tumble. You know, we want to do very measured, thoughtful stuff and, and we're, we're doing the work, we're doing the analysis. We're not there yet of any of those decisions. But but we we also can't afford to have our head in the sand on on what is the art of the possible, and we're not lost on us that our shareholders are looking at our valuation and looking at those other valuations. I'd argue that that same assessment a year from now or two years from now, you know, again selfish, but I'd bet on my business case more than I'd bet on most of those SPAC business cases in terms of coming true. Fair enough. Um, you know, the other question that, that comes up from time to time, and you've kind of addressed it, but, but the dividend, um, you know, and, and capital allocation priorities. I mean, I think, as you said, the, the point for the equity raise was maybe to take a turn of leverage out, um, you know, maybe give you a, a little extra cushion in case something else went wrong with COVID. But, you know, how do we think about, you know, historically, you've been a fairly su significant dividend payer. You should have you know, it sounds like pretty good free cash flow, you know, even from, even from some working capital, you know, next year, in the next couple of years, um, CapEx looks to be minimal, a lot of your product development is done. Um, so how do we think about, you know, where those funds end up going? Well, you know, we can, we, and we've debated this with a couple of really good, thoughtful shareholders, you know, on some one-on-one -on -one calls about, you know, why don't you kill your dividend, uh, de deliver faster or, you know, share buybacks, blah, blah, blah. You know, the history of our business originally when it went public, as you know better than anybody, Chris, was this IDS, which had a very much an income or a yield orientation. And we still have some legacy shareholders that kind of view that. And we have a lot of shareholders, the retail, that, that view our yield as a pretty important part of their reason for investing. So when we started increasing our dividend back, let's call it 15, 16, 17, you know, up through 19, you know, we wanted to be able to put a dividend in place that we knew we could afford, that was sustainable, that we didn't have to jerk up and or jerk down, uh, that people could count on. And that was because we're not a wild growth business. It was an element of our story. There's an there's an equity opportunity appreciation, but there's a little dividend here that makes sense. And there are times in our history where the dividend was stupid. You know, the percent, not the dividend, but the yield percent, it got the 9%, which is never our intent, or at half a percent, which is never our intent. 
So going forward, what we decided last year is let's let's get through COVID. Let's keep our shareholders engaged and looking at our business and interested and confident we're going to recover. The turn of leverage associated with the bot deal was absolutely exactly what it is. The other part of it is that we had put the sidecar in place for $250 million, hoping and planning never to use it. And we canceled that sidecar because you pay for the damn thing. So we, we said, look, let's go get the turn of leverage. We know we got a little bit more a dividend, but it's effectively now giving us that cushion just in case there is a wave three, Chris, or just in case we see a, an opportunity we want to go and buy to, to bolt on something to our business. But very much, uh, you know, re reduction back to a comfort level, a real comfort level of two to two and a half now is, you know, is is within the two or three vision of our two or three year vision, as opposed to, oh my God, that's a five or seven year journey. Very much is what our, our prominent focus is on right now. And, you know, if the business does a little bit better than we projected as we move through 22 and 23, absolutely, we're going to look at that dividend to see is it appropriate relative to the stock price from a yield perspective and, and relative to our affordability. Okay, fair enough. So, you know, we did promise we try to end this thing around one o'clock. I know we did start a little bit late, but um, why don't I give you the floor just to kind of wrap up and any final thoughts to leave with investors? Well, look, thanks to, to you know, ATB Altcorp and the group to, you know, for their support and putting this on today. I know we got a lot of people on the, on the call. So thank you for, for sharing your, uh, your hour with us. You know, I hope you know us, those that have been seeing us for a while, pretty transparent and candid company. If you want a one-on-one -on -one or a separate conversation, by all means, we'd, we'd love to host that. Um, COVID really was, was painful. You know, we, we've had transit agencies go through hell trying to operate their businesses during that COVID essential service. We've tried to support them. You know, we first furloughed 8,200 people. We brought a bunch back. We've unfortunately let 1,500 people go full time. And, you know, there's more to come in terms of the right sizing and optimization of our business. We've experienced, as of yesterday, 675 positive tests across employees of NFI. Knock on wood, there's been a couple that have been real sick. Nobody's passed away. I think there's only one guy that's still kind of in the hospital, but we're in, we're in good shape. Every one of those people have recovered and we couldn't trace any of them to inside business transmission, but everybody lives their own lives. So look, we, we went through hell. The banks have been supportive. The shareholders have been supportive. We've now got a new tranche of shareholders with this, uh, with this bought deal. We're not making unrealistic promises about the recovery of our business or the performance of our products. We are very much an execution oriented business that's on the front edge of that zero emission dynamic. And as much as I sound like a naysayer to many of the investors, this is not a revolution in our space. It's going to take time. And so it's very much, you know, leading the pack in a slow and steady race than a, you know, the journey that we have to win a, a, in a hundred yard dash. We got a good team. We got great support from the board. And so, you know, watch this space. I'm excited about getting through 21 with a nice recovery year and then getting back onto our trajectory through to 2025. So thanks for this, Chris. Okay. Sounds great, guys. Thanks very much. I think we'll end it there.